Now you already know how important language is to me. And I think we would all agree that mathematics is a language. Well, uh, yeah, it's Greek to me. No, that's <laughs> not really what I mean. I mean, it has a syntax, it has a structure. And we've not had a lot of experience with that. We were never really taught that in our education. So what I'd like to do for just a, a brief moment here is to pursue the five parts of mathematical speech. Now in English, last time I checked, we still had the basic eight right? Mm -hmm. Eight parts of speech, and you could rattle them off for me. Well, we get a little bit of a break here. In mathematics, there are only five. Good. So that helps. And listen, your students love it when you use definitives. Only. Always. Every time. <laughs> they feel comfortable in that world. So knowing that there are only five parts of mathematical speech is a start. Let's examine them. Suppose you were going to invent mathematics and you wanted to come up with symbols. What do you suspect would be the first type of symbol that would have ever been developed in mathematics? I'm not talking about sticks, not talking about rocks, I'm talking about some symbol that would represent something mathematical. What do you suspect would be the very first kind of symbol that would have been necessary? Numbers. 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 Symbols to represent quantities. The number symbols. These are the symbols like one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Fractions, three, fourths, decimals, point, eight. All those different types of symbols that represent numbers. Now you've got the numbers. And by the way, these are the things of mathematics, aren't they? They're the objects around which all of arithmetic revolves. That's your focus. Now you've got your numbers, and they're the things what part of speech would you suspect that would be analogous to in the English language? Nouns. Nouns, of course. Nouns. Ladies and gentlemen, every <laughs> language has nouns, even mathematics. Now you have your numbers. What do you suspect would be the next type of symbol that would become important, maybe necessary? You have a three and a four. What do you think? What kind of symbol? An operation. Something to do with them, right? An operation symbol. We're familiar with those. Add, subtract, multiply, divide. We have those symbols. These are the actions of mathematics, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You're ahead of me, aren't you? Yeah. We're talking about what? Verbs. Verbs. Ladies and gentlemen. Every language has nouns. Every language has verbs. Now, my question to you very quickly is, when do we start teaching students in elementary school about nouns and verbs? First thing. Right off the bat, don't we? We can start to identify nouns and verbs. Then why aren't we teaching the nouns and verbs of mathematics at the same time? Instead of waiting till they get to algebra and wonder how these things all fit together, we can do that very early. You have your numbers. Mm -hmm. You have some operations. You can now say three plus four. So what do you think would be another important, necessary, useful symbol? Equal. Is equal to relation symbols. We know the typical trichotomy mm -hmm. is equal to is greater than, is less than. These are the relations of mathematics. Is equal to, is greater than, is less than. They are statements of comparison. This is the same as this. This is greater than this. There's not an operation involved. It just is a statement of relationship. Can you think of any part of speech in the English language that would be comparable? Now you're struggling. Because you see, every language has nouns and verbs. And after that, languages take on their own personalities. Mm -hmm. And you cannot, can you, literally translate from every language into every other language. Mm -hmm. The most heart-rending, moving poem by Robert Frost that brings tears to my eyes just doesn't have the same effect in German 
<laughs> to begin with, the same words don't rhyme. How can you literally translate? So languages have their own personalities. And it's with the commonality of nouns and verbs, after that, things get very particular. I don't really know how that would relate. But the discussion would be important. So now you have numbers, operations, and relations. You can say 3 plus 4 is equal to 7. Now, what are the kind of mass symbol do we use at the elementary level that really doesn't fit into one of those categories? What do you see in arithmetic problems that has an impact on how you work with them? Parentheses. Parentheses sort of helped you out there, didn't it? <laughs> Parentheses. Grouping symbols. We've already been using some. We've been using parentheses here, haven't we? Yep. But we're talking about things like brackets and braces. And Now, at the elementary level, what else do you use to group? Draw a circle around. Mm -hmm. There's lots of things you can use to group things together. That's a grouping symbol. It is showing the associations of mathematics. Can you think of a part of speech that that would relate to? Well, probably not. We're having trouble here again. But it is really nice to know that at least there is something in English that you use in a sentence and it will allow you to manipulate and change the meaning of that sentence without ever moving a single word. And what is that? Punctuation. Punctuation. Not a part of speech, but a very powerful tool in English because put the comma here, put the quotes here, and you can completely change the meaning of the sentence. Well, in mathematics, when you have a string of numbers and operators, if you just move the parentheses around, you can completely change the meaning of that, can't you? All I'm trying to say is, I think students can understand those analogies very early on, and we ought to be teaching mathematics as a language very, very early. Grouping symbols. There's got to be just one more. I said there were five. Yeah. What have we not talked about that would become necessary and useful in mathematical operations? Especially, I'll give you a little bit of a, a, a hint, especially as you get into algebra. Variables. Those variables, those letters that we use to represent things, right? These are, uh, we call them variables, but there is a more, a more effective term, a more explanatory term that they are also called when you get into upper level mathematics and they're called placeholders. Because that's really what an X does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It holds the place. These are the unknowns. Now, we've already said every language has nouns, every language has verbs. After that, things get a little bit particular to the language, but here we get a bonus. <laughs> Think about the parts of speech in the English language. What kind of words, what type of words do we have that simply hold the place of something until you decide what to put in there? Pronouns. Pronouns. He, she, them, they. Don't know who that is until you tell me. In the meantime, I'm going to use a placeholder. These are like the pronouns. Hmm. Sort of cool, isn't it? Yeah. That when we look at the five parts of mathematical speech, we have something in three of the five that we can directly relate to the English language. Mm -hmm. Sort of exciting to see that. Now, there are no others. I don't care how far you go in mathematics, you only have the five parts of speech. You may extend the lists. You may encounter new kinds of operations. You may encounter new kinds of, of placeholder symbols, new types of numbers. But they will all be able to be categorized into those five parts. Very important to understand that and be yourself and be able to translate that to students because of their understanding and their ability to develop the structure of mathematics as a language. 